2023 saw a number of new desktop Macs released that were long overdue. We finally got an iMac refresh after skipping a generation, a new Mac Mini was released after a long wait, and we also got an updated Mac Studio. I was lucky enough to test out all of these machines in the past year, and I used a couple of them as my primary work machines for quite a while, and in that time, there were some things that I fell in love with, and some things that I didn't really like. Today I want to get into all of that, the good and bad aspects of the desktop Macs that were released in 2023, what to look out for, and if you should even consider buying any of these at this stage or just wait for the next generation. So if you've been looking at desktop Macs or you just want to see how these stack up against each other, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. Desktop computers are becoming less and less common these days, but there can be a pretty big advantage to choosing them if you don't need the mobility of a laptop. You can get a lot more value out of a desktop in terms of price versus performance, or in the case of something like the iMac, an all-in-one computer with everything that you need in the box without having to worry about buying a monitor or any accessories. This year, I've been super fortunate to have tested every desktop Mac that came out this year, except for the Mac Pro, which no one should probably buy anyway, but I think that's given me somewhat of a unique perspective on these machines, and I just wanted to share a general overview of my thoughts after a full year of switching between all of these. I did the same thing last week with all the 2023 MacBooks, and I think it's just a good way to close out the year. Unlike the MacBooks, I think my pros and cons for each of these is a little more varied, and the actual reasoning for why you might buy each of these has changed quite a bit over the course of the year. So I want to start off by going all the way back to early winter when I bought the Mac Mini. First of all, the Mac Mini holds Holds a special place in my heart because it was the first Mac that I bought and ever did any substantial work on. I used to cart one of these around in a backpack with me to and from a startup that I was working for at the time, so whenever these come out, I usually check them out because of that connection. Mac Minis have always kind of been an entry-level Mac for the most part, but this year that changed a bit with Apple offering it in an M2 Pro chip. It's important to understand that when this came out, there was no M2 Max, Max Studio, only an M1 Max. And these new M2 series Pro machines that were released last winter had some notable upgrades over the M1 series. They added Bluetooth 5.3 and Wi-Fi 6E, where previously they only came with Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0. That made a pretty big difference in network speeds, and overall, I liked the value that I got out of the M2 Pro Mini more than the Max Studio at the time, which is why I chose one with 32 gigs of RAM and a one terabyte SSD that slotted in at 1899 USD, $100 cheaper than the Mac Studio. I was very happy with the Mac Mini and used that for about five months and it supported my entire creative workflow from editing photos and videos to graphic design and coding. And there were very few things that I didn't like about it, but there were some. I've never really liked how the bottom is plastic and it slides around fairly easily. From owning an M1 Mac Mini in the past, I know how easily that can scratch up and it just makes it a pain for plugging stuff into the ports on the back. I alleviated that issue by putting little silicon furniture tabs on mine to prevent it from slipping or getting marked up, but the ports themselves also had good and bad aspects to them. It was nice that they expanded the ports on the M2 Pro version of the Mac Mini with four Thunderbolt 4 ports instead of just two that were on the regular Mac Mini, which I never really liked on the previous gen. I do wish that they would have put the 3.5mm jack beside the USB ports instead of under them because I did find it to to obstruct some accessories, but that was pretty minor. You also got the updated HDMI spec on the Mini, allowing you to connect a 4K monitor at 240Hz, where previously you could only connect 4K up to 60Hz. So if you owned an M1 Mini that had a higher refresh rate monitor like I did at the time, you needed to use up one of the two USB-C ports on your monitor, so all in all, there were a lot of great improvements on the Mini. During my time with this, I'd say that it was fairly easy to justify buying a higher spec Mini like this versus the M1 Max Mac Studio because they did perform somewhat similar and you got some decent upgrades, but that all changed in June when the new M2 Max Mac Studios were released. All those advantages that the Mini had, like the HDMI port spec, Wi-Fi 6E, and Bluetooth 5.3 all came to the studio and you got better overall performance as well. So specking out a Mini like I did didn't 
really make sense anymore. I moved to the Mac Studio with a base M2 Max configuration as my primary machine as soon as it came out, and I did a ton of comparisons between the Mini and the Studio. The CPU performance was about 20% better on the M2 Max, and honestly, I didn't really notice a ton of difference between the two with things like software development and everyday tasks. But when I got into resource-heavy workflows, specifically that utilized the GPU, like 3D work and Blender or effects and plugins while video editing, the studio performed much better. As a side note, one interesting thing that I found that I mentioned last week is I expected the M2 Max to perform similarly with the M3 Pro in my MacBook Pro, with the studio having over double the GPU cores at 30 versus 14 in the M3 Pro, but because the M3 Pro has hardware-enabled ray tracing, it actually keeps up with the studio in a lot of areas, which is pretty impressive. The studio I had had less storage space than the Mini that I was using with 512 gigs, but I run almost everything from an external SSD anyway, so it's not something that I ever noticed, to be honest. I think earlier this year, I was a little bit more concerned with SSD speeds being slow on the M2 Pro models versus the M1 Pro. There was a lot of news surrounding those speeds when the M2 Pro machines came out, which is partially why I opted for a one terabyte drive in the Mini. Those drives run at much higher speeds than the 512 gig options below them, and because it did run a lot faster, I thought that it might equate to things running a bit smoother when I ramped up my system usage, but it honestly made no difference whether I I used that drive or the external one that I was using previously. The main issues that I had with the studio had nothing to do with their performance, but just a couple of design flaws. It's great that the studio has ports on the front. The USB ports are super handy for plugging in and charging accessories, and as a content creator, Having an SD card reader was something that I was looking forward to having, but I always found it to work intermittently and be unreliable, which is why I stuck with my CalDigit TS4 hub. Also, because the bottom of this housing is, again, more of a plastic material versus rubber, which it probably should be, it slides around very easily, so you almost always need two hands to plug stuff in, and it just feels a bit clumsy in that sense. It's a small complaint, but this seems to be the case with almost every Apple product, including the iMac, which can slide around a bit as well. The newest iMac is the most recent Mac that I looked at and reviewed, and it made quite an impression on me for completely different reasons. Unlike the Mini and the Studio that I'd purchased, this was really the only Mac that I wasn't planning to be my main work machine, but I more so just wanted to get a sense for how it worked, and hopefully provide some value for folks who were potentially considering buying one of these, so I came in with no expectations. I bought the model that sat just one level up from the base version, so it did have an 8-core CPU and 10-core GPU with a couple more USB-C ports, but still only had 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD. I say that that configuration is more so just for basic use, so things like web browsing, checking emails, productivity, that kind of thing. If you want to do more with it, I'd definitely bump up the RAM and the storage, but the interesting thing is the base M3 chip performs very similarly to the M2 Pro. I was able to edit a video on it just fine and do some photo editing and other things, but for me, performance wasn't the thing that I was the most impressed with, but all the components within it. The M3 iMac has a 24-inch 4.5K display that looks outstanding, the speakers in it are surprisingly good as well, and everything just feels like it's extremely high quality. Using this is what actually influenced me to buy the Apple Studio display because I wanted that same feeling that I got with the iMac, but with my M3 Pro MacBook at my desk. I think if you're just straight up looking for a good desktop Mac and you don't have any accessories purchased like a monitor or speakers, the iMac is a fantastic choice. You literally only have one cable at your desk and you're gonna get great performance if you bump up those specs a little bit. And you don't need to worry about getting a webcam or keyboard or mouse or anything at all. So I think there's a lot of value there. I think each of these machines serves a purpose and the lineup I'd say here is probably a little bit less confusing than the MacBooks. With a Mac mini, that's your cheapest point of entry into Mac OS. And while I don't think that it makes sense to get the configuration that I was using, there's still a lot of value in the base M2 versions or the M2 Pro version that sits around $1299. The Mac Studio is obviously the heavy hitter here, and if you want one of these right now, it'll run pretty much everything that you throw at it. The one thing that I will say is if you plan on waiting on the next iteration of the Studio, there are reports saying that the M3 variant of it might not come out until late 2024 or early 2025. So if you're hoping that this version will show up at WWDC like it has in past years, that may not be the case this go around. When it comes down to it, 
good. I think that most folks can get a lot out of even the base M2 and M3 chips, as long as you bump up the RAM a little to cover your storage needs. And even though the newest MacBook Pros have M3 Pro and Max chips, while the desktop machines do not, they're still worth checking out if you'd rather have a desktop Mac over a laptop. You always have the option of using your MacBook in a stand like a desktop if you want to get into the latest chips, which is what I'm currently doing, but you're probably going to want a decent USB hub and some accessories to go along with it. And when everything is said and done, that can be a little bit harder on your wallet. I'm not sure what 2024 will bring, but I'd love to see a new Mac Mini, and I really do hope we see an updated studio earlier than the end of the year. Right now, the only Macs that I've seen to be rumored released somewhat earlier next year are MacBook Airs, but I'm sure that we'll get some surprises at some point. With that said, I'd love to get some feedback from everyone else here. Is there a Mac that you'd like to see get refreshed early next year? And if so, what would you like to see show up in those Macs that maybe hasn't been released on these models? Let me know in the comments down below. So that's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed this video or found it useful. If you did, feel free to give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more tech related content or help me create and run through an obstacle course in my backyard and time each other, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in 2024. Hopefully, unless I get hit by a bus and then you should have a candlelight vigil for me and spread my joyous content around the internet. Okay, see you next year.